from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news, features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell in the ABC's studio in Melbourne after I donned a black tie outfit last night for the Australia Cricket Awards and saw both Mitch Marsh and Ash Gardner pick up the uh, Belinda Clark medal and the Alan Border medal. And it was a really, really good night, Jim. We missed you. Hi, Jim Maxwell in Sydney. And uh, there's no serious cricket on, but we've had some awards, the Alan Border medal and the rest of it. Very exciting. And uh, it's taken a few people by surprise with uh, some of the decisions made uh, and what was a, a very entertaining evening. And I'm Shahrukh Sharma in the home of Akashwani, New Delhi this week. Plenty of cricket in our part of the world. Uh, some of it embarrassing, but of course there will be time to try and uh, claw their uh, way back. But uh, I've been myself playing some cricket the last 10 days or so, missed the last week's show. So plenty of oohs and ahs and <laughs> injuries and what have you. But here we are, let's go. I hope you wear a helmet, Charo, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> now, in a bit, we are going to look at exactly how India might bounce back from, well, I was going to say an extraordinary, Charo just said embarrassing, opening test defeat mm -hmm. to England. Mm -hmm. And we'll be finding out about spinner Tom Hartley after his match-winning haul on debut. But we are going to start by looking back on that astonishing, historic and emotional test win for the West Indies in Brisbane. Jim and I were both at the Gabba as, against all the odds, the lowly ranked West Indies won a test in Australia for the first time since 1997. Well, you would have heard all about Shamar Joseph in last week's show, the 24-year-old from the backwater of Barakara in Guyana, playing only his second test match and bowling despite that toe-crushing Yorker from Mitch Stark the night before that left him unlikely to bowl at all. And he took a remarkable 7 for 68, one of the all-time great bowling spells uh, in that sensational win by just eight runs. And it ensured that the two-match series ended tied at one apiece. Uh, Jim... Your commentary at the end was brilliant. I moved out of the seat and handed over to you for the climax, just as, well, Steve Smith was getting close to taking Australia home, wasn't he? But how was that moment for you and with Carl Hooper, the legendary batter, alongside you? Because he was part of the last West Indies team to win a test match in Australia. Well, he was very emotional. I, I think there's a bit on social media of him there alongside me with Glenn McGrath on the other side. And uh, he was so overcome by what had occurred at the end that he stood up and walked away and, um, well, burst into tears. I think a lot of people have seen that footage. Uh, and uh, fair enough, um, it was the most extraordinary afternoon. Uh, Australia just seemed to be working their way towards a four or five wicket win. Uh, Steve Smith was in good nick. And then all of a sudden, this young bloke had turned up and he bowled fast and he kept bowling fast. He bowled fast for 10 overs. He was as fast in his 10th as he was in his first. And he hit the stumps four times to get those seven wickets. So I think that tells you something about the quality of his bowling, which just, just stunned us all from nowhere, uh, stunned the world. So that's yeah. what we love about the game of cricket. A young yeah. bloke can just turn up and all of a sudden blast the opposition away. It's one of the great things about cricket when a fast bowler does that. It wasn't Kirtley Ambrose of all those years ago, but it might be. It might be. It was an amazing sight, wasn't it? The World Test Champions up against a squad with seven uncapped players due to the likes of Jason Holder and Carl Mayers choosing franchise T20 cricket instead of the Tests. And then they were playing at a ground where Australia had only lost once in 36 years and they'd never lost a day-night test at all. And yet, well, I've been catching up with one of the other debutants, uh, the all-rounder Kevin Sinclair, who made his debut in that Gabba Test match and played his part with a vital half-century, a stunning catch, and then a maiden test wicket, which prompted an acrobatic celebration which went viral and Kevin began by telling me first and foremost just what it meant to be playing test cricket for the West Indies. Me walking out and you know taking my guard and everyone clapping Mitchell Stark you know to you know to get me and his first ball because he had four wicket already so I was kind of nervous but when the first ball get past me you know I was like damn I am here now nervousness gone so yeah focus on the next ball so it was really exciting for me you know, my people back home, my grandfather, my parents, my siblings, you know. Yeah, and everyone who know my upbringing, you know, they were, they was very proud of me in that moment. What's the reaction been from back home in the wake of, you know, following through and getting that historic victory? Everyone 
messaging me and said they cried. They was very emotional. You know, we 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 done something really sensational. It was really remarkable. Everyone like was in you know disbelief, I should say, but we pull it off and everyone enjoy it. You know, bring back some real great memories to West Indies cricket. You know, outstanding performance there by Shamar Joseph. You know, he stuck it out for his team and pull off something really sensational and one of the one of his dream spell, I should say. He would really, you know, cherish that moment for a very long time. What happened then in the immediate aftermath of the victory at the Gabba? What was going on in the uh, minutes, hours after the win? Well, all the guys, you know, rally around us, you know, me sharing, sharing how special, special the moment was, you know. I've having done something like that in so many years, you know, I mean, I think since in 1977, nine, I can't yeah. really, yeah, yeah, 97, so yeah. Before so you were born. Yeah, yeah I born 99, <laughs> I born 99, two years after I born. Yeah, so all the guys was very, very much happy for us, you know, because a lot of people count us out and, you know, we stuck and we just deliver for the people of West Indies and, you know, who had doubts in us, you know, maybe just, you know, you know, prove them wrong. Yeah, was that real motivation? We heard from Craig Brathwaite in the presentation that, you know, you guys sort of took a lot of that quite to heart. Yeah, definitely. That was our motivation, you know, coming into the the the, the, the last test. You know, that was our motivation because they come to you out till we are weak. We we are lamb for the slaughters and these things. So we just take that as a motivation and just come and give it our all in this last game and it pay off. You know what I mean? So in all the departments, you know, we click. You know, the 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 first test finished in two days and two days and a little bit. So everybody just count us out. You know what I mean? So yeah, we just bring that that passion and that hunger in this game, and you know, we really pull it off. Kudos to Shamar and his outstanding performance. I must mention it again. Uh, it it really was outstanding yeah. from Shamar. Yeah, yeah. What about your maiden Test wicket though, and the celebration, which many of us were expecting. I want to know, did you actually have some gymnastics training when you were a kid? Ah, uh, yeah. For me, I, I back in my area in Angais Avenue, known as Kaudam. Even most people rec- um, would say it's Kaudam. But it's Angais Avenue, Patrick Dam. So back in the backlands, we go and practice somersault. You know, you, you, you're not going to go into negative activities, you know what I mean, and do do other stuff. So you just go as kids in the backlands and just practice your somersault, practice your landing. I should say. Yes, you stuck so, that yeah, landing. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. So that was my fun back in the day. So I just do it whenever I get wicked to remind them about my area and where I'm from. So that celebration is basically for my area. I was listening to Shamar Joseph at the end of the match last night and he was asked about kind of his you know, projected future in the test game. And he was you know, being asked about, of course, offers that will likely come in from you know T20 franchise leagues and so on. What yeah. what are your ambitions, and do you think you will be able to sort of afford to play Test cricket if bigger offers come elsewhere? How will you balance that going forward? Do you think? Obviously, like I like I said, you know, looking looking back at the T's performance, there, you know, what I mean, T twenty one one bring that special special feeling to the Caribbean people in that way. Yes, you're representing a franchise, but representing the people of the Caribbean is something big in the whole. You know what I mean? You won't, yes, you might make a, a century or a half century in a franchise league, but that won't feel much special, you know, doing it for you, you know, for the people of the West Indies. So for me, my dream was to perform for the West Indies, play for the West Indies and perform. That was my dream. And that is something really, really special. Yes, you can get off of there, but I think Test Cricket is the ultimate. Test Cricket is it. And Test Cricket will definitely live for a very, very long time. I don't think T20 is going to get ever get ahead of Test Cricket. And did you see the tears in the eyes of Brian Lara, Carl Hooper, who I know that you're pretty close to? Because, you know, these are guys I've worked with for a long, long time and they've they've lived through the, the doldrums and the, just seeing their happiness, I found really moving. Yeah, very, very much touching, you know, to see Brian Brian Lara cry and even Carl Hooper cry there as well. You could you could tell, you could tell, you know, you could tell how happy they were and, you know, bringing back that memory when they was playing as well, you know. They, you know, they were beating Australia as well, you know. So bring back that memory and that feeling, you know, into this, to this generation now is something really special for them to witness 
like so Carl said, 2024, he could witness something like this. He never felt this way when he was married, I believe, in, in a comment. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> something like that. You never been as right? happy as when he was married, yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, like, it's, like, I'm so happy and so grateful to be a part of something like this. And it's really special, even for the greats of West Indies, you know, cricket, being here, Ian Bishop, Brian Lara, Carl Hooper, and all, all of the other icons of the game as well from cricket Australia as well you know they encourage every day to see you they got get have a smile on their face keep going giving you a thumbs up well done things like that it's good to see you know I me mean, Arlo you know it's cricket Australia versus West Indies rather you could see that that kind of u- unity on and off the field I mean on the field of play you're gonna get a little little war but I mean yeah they're happy for us and we pull it off. So I must say that win is something really, really special for all of us and all the people in the Caribbean. Well, that was West Indies all-rounder Kevin Sinclair on his dream debut, helping West Indies to that historic win over Australia at the Gabba. Charu, I mean, just when we start to worry about Test cricket, and we have spoken a lot about the worries around Test cricket in recent weeks, it then goes and produces something like that. And Kevin was talking very enthusiastically about Test cricket. It will live for a very, very long time he says, just first of all, how important you know, has it been to see Test cricket have that sort of special uh, moment and resonance for the people of the Caribbean? Well, at this point of time, it's tough to be cynical, isn't it? Because, I mean, it was two fabulous Test matches, one in Australia, one in India, and you feel Test matches are in great health. But we know better. I mean, they are suffering uh, to quite an extent in many countries, and I do still worry about the future of Test match cricket in a more macro sense. If you take a look at the micros in the last couple of test matches, you feel, wow, it's in great health. And of course, there's also the, the whole commercial attraction. Now, you've got to be really, well, I mean, what can I say? You've got to be so resistant to the lure of uh, the commercials that are offered for white ball cricket to then continue to focus on test match cricket. For the moment, of course, after such a high we we'll have to admit that everybody who loves West Indian cricket and all that emotion attached, I mean, they've gone from very emotional to very cynical, blasé, back to emotional as well because of that one victory. So uh, in an isolated fashion, it's done an enormous amount for West Indian cricket, for our belief in West Indian cricket, and of course in Test Match cricketers as well. But in the long run, can they sustain it? And can the world sustain Test Match cricket which, with close finishes and with the underdog winning? Because that's what makes news. Uh, I wish it well. I'm very fond of Test Match cricket. But, you know, you do wonder whether there's more and more white ball cricket uh, in the offing and whether even somebody as resolute as Sinclair might eventually do a holder and and, uh, the others who backed off. It's going to be interesting to watch, isn't it? I mean, Jim, I was in the press conference when Shamar Joseph said outright, he kept saying, I'm happy to put this on the record. There will be times when T20 comes around and test cricket will be there, but I will always be available for West Indies, no matter how much money comes towards me. And Brian Lara at this point was in the press conference in his shorts and T-shirt, filming it on his phone, and he started slapping his thigh in approval with his other hand at this point, hearing those words. You know, you don't want to be cynical at this point in time, do you? Because it is joyous. But, you know, you can't help but wonder, like, will this actually bring sort of tangible change for those less wealthy test nations? Or is this going to go down as one glorious moment in time? Romanticism versus realism. Yes. Where are we going? Um, (laughs) I like to give it all a bit of context, which was how I was feeling at the the time in the the conclusion of the game. Mm. And saying, you know, it's 63 years since the tied test. It's the Frank Worrell Trophy. Has anyone seen Frank Worrell's speech? They should. That'll make you feel special about uh, the whole of the history as we turn things over in the way we have the other day with this extraordinary performance, really, by the West Indies. But as I say, let's be realistic. I mean, it's up to the administrators to a large extent, not Shamar Joseph, as to mm. how often the West Indies play test cricket. Two test series are a nonsense. Mm. I mean, one thing about Shamar Joseph, he had a, a contract with Dubai Capitals in the ILT20 prior to this test series. Of course, then, you know, his toe gets busted by Mitchell Stark. He is ruled out now of that ILT20. And given everything we know about his Good. backstory and the poverty of where he came from, 
you sort of think, oh, that's exactly why players do opt out of Test cricket because they don't want to risk an injury, which then puts them out of the more lucrative tournament. But he has, Charu, been snapped up by Darren Sammy, the West Indies white ball coach, is also in charge of Peshawar Zalmi in the Pakistan Super League. So he is being picked up as a replacement player there. So there is there's always another league to go to, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, Shawar has got to be on everybody's radar right now. And uh, a lot of teams may be hoping that they have an injury and therefore the right to a replacement. Say, Shamar, come on over. But <laughs> exactly. it's going to be very difficult for Shamar to stay away from all the T20 leagues. And I do hope that West Indies play enough Test match cricket uh, in the near future to be able to utilize those abilities. But what a fabulous talent. And I don't know whether I can say this with any legitimacy, but it did remind me a bit about Jofra Archer, where he's just he sneaks up on you. He's just so athletic, so swift, so fluent. And as Jim said earlier, he kept that pace up, the energy up yeah. all the way through. Uh, it was quite brilliant. The accuracy mm. as well. So everything that you would expect from a fast bowler, and he's not one of the biggest, but certainly one of the most fluent I've seen in recent times. And uh, if he can just keep it going, we know how too much cricket, but we shouldn't say too much cricket, because after all, it's a profession and they need to play as much as they possibly can. But, you know, there are these things called injuries. He's already been through one. And I hope the back stays okay because that's really tough for the fast bowlers uh, but Shamar was quite a revelation just fabulous finally then on stumped it was described as extraordinary and phenomenal England produced one of their best ever wins away from home to stun India and start their five match test series with the most unlikely of victories it was an immense turnaround in Hyderabad most notably from England number three Ollie Pope who was out for just one in the first innings, but then conjured up one of the all-time great test innings, making 196 to give England a chance, as they were then spun to a surprising 28-run victory by debutant Tom Hartley. Charu, then what of India in this second test match? Because no Virat Kohli and now no Jadeja and no KL Rahul. So can India bounce back to make it one all? Uh, well, I'd love to say yes, because uh, after all, they're playing at Vishaka Patnam. This is the third test match. They won previously against uh, England there, uh, and I think South Africa was. So, you know, there's a certain sense of, sense of historical confidence going into the test match. But uh, they have to be worried, because their second line hasn't been working fabulously. And, and uh, Rahul was in reasonably good form. Jadeja, of course, on any one day can win you either with bat or ball. Uh, so these injuries are, and Kohli not being there are beginning to take toll. And I wonder if the second line is now suddenly shaky because they feel that there's a lot of pressure and people might say they're not good enough. So there's all sorts of psychology working at this point of time in India now with the players. But if uh, they have a, a mental trainer or whatever, I think somebody needs to sit down with them and say, listen, you are good enough. You are the favoured team and you don't lose easily to anyone at home. So it's just a question of getting that confidence back. Uh, which at this point of time, I think is just a shade shaky because all of them will be going back to the dressing room saying, how did we lose that test match? I mean, there's no way we should have lost it. So I hope that it's a confidence thing. And if they play as confidently as, as, as you know, their uh, situation in world cricket uh, and playing at home uh, will make us believe, then I, I think they are still, if I may say so, favoured. Well, that's all we've got time for on this week's Stumps. So I'll say thank you to Jim Maxwell and to Charis Sharma. And of course, to all of you, make sure you join us again next week. Until then, bye-bye.